I wanted to start out first by saying something I do ask, something people don't usually know about you uh, for information. BG shared with me that she used to know Deep Throat, Mark Felt, who is her uncle's best friend. Deep Throat being the FBI agent with Watergate, not the porn star. <laughs> I would like to welcome B.G. Thurston, who's here. <laughs> I do have a few more things to say about you, not just the deep throat. <laughs> B.G. is a poet who grew up in northern Ohio in the woods and loved to play with her metal barn and her little animals. And these days, she moved out to Warwick, where she has a real life farm that uh, she manages with her husband, including sheep and chickens and horses and lots of other things there. That keeps her very busy, and she also loves tinkering with jewelry and antique iron. BG said that for some reason poetry kept coming into her life throughout it, and it, it, she said it chose me, not vice versa. She got involved in business and then motherhood, and in her 40s went back to school for MFA in creative writing. And she went on to write poetry and publish and give workshops. And many of you know her for hosting very popular poetry reading at Borders Bookstore in Framingham. BG has one published chapbook, and more recently, a book of her collected poems titled Night Walking. And when asked why poetry is important, BG said, poetry makes us think. More importantly, it makes us feel. It connects one soul to another. And I feel a poem becomes its own entity after the poet finishes it, and it usually then belongs to the world. So uh, I thank BG for her words and look forward to her words of poetry she'll be sharing with us now. So please help give a warm round of applause for BG Thurston. The first poem is called The Ghost. I have not left the world. It was poetry who abandoned me, or so I believed. Now when I hold my hands over my ears, I see the echo from the sparrow's throat. And when I close my eyes tight, I smell the color of blood and rust. Holding my palm over my heart, I feel nothing as words continue falling all around my feet. And a lot of these are new poems, but I will read poems from the book. Um, the book is, it took a long time coming out because the publisher had some financial considerations. And uh, since poetry isn't exactly going to make anyone rich, I could understand that. But uh, I'm very happy that um, Haley's brought out this book as well as Candace's. So the second poem is called Spell Weaving. The crone is seated at her loom, a distaff of disarray. Two robins appear on the lawn, pecking through a veneer of ice. Light gathers at the lake's edge, choked by husks and broken stalks. A flurry of noise, wings and splashing, seven geese on the pond melt. When I see three crows by the road, I bow my head and bless my mother. Now the lamentation of swans who remain hidden, coupled in nests. When the owl lodges in the tree and hoots his nightly call, I cannot answer. While porcupines hiss and mate, a fawn steps from the forest. Pages turn, prayers beg for release, bright flight of two swans flying. Stars are woven into my heart, and the moon is my mother's face. I realized this year, uh, on February 1st, that my mother had died exactly 10 years ago. So that brought her back into my poems, and so a lot of these do reference her. 
mud season. Again spring arrives, uninvited visitor, arms full of flowers, showy and short-lived. No matter the rain, we walk these woods. These paths we understand, counterclockwise and color-coded. This season of mud sucks at the dog's paws as they pull me down root-laced trails. Unseen crows are raising a ruckus. The forest fills with their caucus of complaint. Nearby, ominous creaking. A white pine ready to let go into the air. I pause, wishing to witness this end, to hear its fall. This winter, I have lost three earrings here, and it comforts me to know that they will remain. I'm learning how to let go of everything I love. As far as I can see, we leave this life with nothing, and I want to be ready. Uh, this poem is in my book, but I don't know where I marked it, so I'll read it off this page. My mother's stroke. After four days in intensive care, St. Patrick's Day passes, a hypertensive blur of rising fractions. I cling to the remainders, laundry, walking the dog. I try not to believe the signs. What can't I solve? In February, I heard my father's voice while washing dishes as clear as could be, predicting that my mother would join him soon. I hate premonitions. Their probabilities factoring into fate. The first night, a priest's black garb flew by us to the next bed, where a man's denomination dwindled to zero. We heard the slow recitations of unstable and all we can do, then crashing code cut. The Trinity is deemed an equilateral triangle. She asked how old he was. I was quick to calculate, really old. His daughter is lots older than I am. Last week, she turned 81, opened seven presents, but didn't get her wish. Tomorrow's spring equinox balances its egg of time on a swollen branch. Light lengthens for foolhardy flowers, counting on a son's sympathy. I drive to the hospital daily, past graveyards still in snow, where markers surface like beads of a giant abacus. I sit in a chair, waiting to hear my father explain a new equation with his old slide rule, tallying unknowns. And actually, that used to bring me to tears because they moved me from Ohio to Illinois to Ohio, and I did three different junior highs and three different new maths. Oh, no. And so I'd go home confused, and he would try to teach me from his slide rule. So I just cried. <laughs> so this poem is called March. Last night, a scythe of moon cut the sky as trees lay down shadows upon the snow. Each morning, branches of spruce shudder the sparse sunlight as I climb the logging road, breathless in evergreen air, to witness what has fallen and what remains. I can no longer bear this winter, the doubts and regrets layered like snow and ice covering my garden. There, the stony face of an angel barely floats above the white surface. But today, the rooster practices spring for hours. His favorite hen has grown, gone broody in her box. Fecundity returns in an elliptical promise. Still, tonight, there will be no moon. <clears throat> and then I still have that rooster. 
he's a bantam rooster, and I have all big hens, so he thinks he's really hot stuff. <laughs> so these are three. Um, recently, when I've been writing, they're very short, and I don't know whether that was because I had some memory problems when I was ill, or whether that's just the way my writing is going to go now. But I'm going to read these three together. The first one is called Keepsake. A tangerine moon alone in the sky, an orange pancake, my mother's compact smell of pressed powder, dusty round mirror holds the reflection of her face in the palm of my hand. The second one is pressure point. I rub the arches of her blackened feet, lift the heels and watch the color drain. My warm fingers lightly encircle coolness. I press against each sole and find the kidney place. My hope, which knows no better, is a touch. And the third one is called The Offer. Two years of waiting for fortunes to change. Unseasonal warmth fills the house with ladybugs ticking over the window panes. We are numb to news so long in coming, almost indifferent to the opportunity which appears ahead, shimmering mirage-like. Now we are afraid to hold out our fingers and feel the glitter falling over them. And two more. Night Walking, which is the title poem of this book and is the last poem in the book. Night Walking is a um, linked haiku, I should say. A half moon barely enough to light my way in this darkness. Head craned upward, searching for constellations, drawn to black space. I almost stumble over a snapping turtle who does not notice. Eyes full of moonbeams, intent upon shifting ground, her eggs glistening. Forgotten orbs brooding under the night sky, she lumbers back to the swamp, leaving me to ponder the blossoming of each hidden moon. And as I got home from work last night and I was timing all this out, my younger daughter said, well, that's not fair. You didn't read anything about your father. So my last poem will be trying to balance that. The Feel of Moss. I cannot say how I found you, only that it was at the base of an oak in the darkness, after the moon's grin slipped behind tra trees that swayed like drunks heading home. Before that, you ignored me. My demands that you visit, my dreams, just once, to tell me where you went. But I never find anything until I have given up. In that moment, at last, I felt your presence, a presence like a touch, a memory of a smell, a moment of embrace. Thank you very much. Prognosis. Coming late, these words miss the point, remain imprisoned in their own expectation. I have already climbed the mountain. My pockets are filled with mist. Later, if you seek me, look among the hard stones of the trail or the knotted roots of the pines where they cling to exposed rock. That is what my mind is becoming now. Thank you. Haley's Comet. 
Miss Murphy in the first grade wrote its name in chalk across the board and told us it was roaring down the storm tracks of the Milky Way at frightful speed. And if it wandered off course and smashed into Earth, there'd be no school tomorrow. <laughs> a red-bearded preacher from the hills with a wild look in his eyes stood in the public square at the playground's edge, proclaiming he was sent by God to save every one of us, even the little children. Repent, ye sinners, he shouted, waving his hand-lettered sign. At supper, I felt sad to think it was probably the last meal I'd share with my mother and sisters, but I felt excited, too, and scarcely touched my plate. So mother scolded me and sent me up to my room. The whole family asleep except for me. They never heard me steal into the stairwell hall and climb the ladder into the fresh night air. Look for me, Father, on the roof of the red brick building at the foot of Green Street. That's where we live, you know, on the top floor. I'm the boy in the white flannel gown, sprawled on this coarse gravel bed, searching the starry sky, waiting for the world to end. The layers. <clears throat> I have walked through many lives, some of them my own, and I'm not who I was, though some principle of being abides from which I struggle not to stray. When I look behind as I am compelled to look, before I can gather strength to proceed on my journey, I see the milestones dwindling toward the horizon and the slow fires trailing from the abandoned campsites over which scavenger angels wheel on heavy wings. Oh, I have made myself a tribe out of my true affections, and my tribe is scattered. How shall the heart be reconciled to its feast of losses? In a rising wind, the manic dust of my friends, those who fell along the way, bitterly stings my face. Yet I turn, I turn, exulting somewhat with my will intact to go, whatever I used to go, wherever I used to go, and every stone on the road precious to me. In my darkest night, when the moon was covered and I roamed through wreckage, a nimbus clouded voice directed me, live in the layers not on the litter. Though I lack the art to decipher it, no doubt the next chapter in my book of transformations is already written. I am not done with my changes. Thank you.
so we are three where we were two as we hold our baby blue and I love you so We are the music makers and we are the dreamers of dreams, wandering by lone sea breakers and sitting by desolate streams, world losers and world forsakers on whom the pale moon gleams, yet we are the movers and shakers of the world forever, it seems. With wonderful deathless ditties, we build up the world's great cities and out of a fabulous story, we fashion an empire's glory. One man with a dream at pleasure shall go forth and conquer a crown, and three with a new song's measure can trample an empire down. We in the ages of lying in the buried past of the earth built Nineva with our sighing and Babel itself with our mirth, and o'er through them with prophesying to the old of the new world's worth. For each age is a dream that is dying for one or one that is coming to birth. And that is owed by Arthur Osho. Don't you, don't you drive with me, don't you drive, don't you drive. 
Don't you try Don't you try once again to drive north, bring these disjointed parts and hope to make a complete whole within space and time, knowing neither of which are fixed here by lakes early morning light or there with ocean diving pelicans. That's it, thank you.